Genesis chapter number 39. Genesis chapter number 39. We are going to be resuming the story of Joseph being sold into slavery and to Egypt. Now, I had mentioned uh, when we were in Genesis chapter number 37 that basically the rest of the book of Genesis was going to be about Joseph. And right now we're going we're gonna to start seeing everything focused toward Joseph. And really there is no break from this point uh, forward from following Joseph around and, and uh, uh, different things that happened to Joseph, all of that. We're going to see uh, what takes place in Egypt. And he's pretty much the focus or the theme of the rest of the book of Genesis. In G Genesis chapter number 38, we had a brief concession. Uh, we saw the things that took place with Judah and Tamar, and that, of course, was recorded to follow the line of Christ. So we had that information uh, about the, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. If you go back to Genesis 37, just to refresh your mind, uh, where we left off with the story of Joseph, Genesis chapter number 37, we're going to see there at the end of verse number 36, it tells us, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, and then it says, and captain of the guard. So we're given information there. You can even tell that it's kind of a cliffhanger. Uh, there's, a, there's a, a, as I said, a slight, uh, a brief concession. Uh, there's this parenthetic uh, chapter here where it starts to talk about something else for just a, a short, uh, 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 you know, 30 verses. And then it picks back up with the story of Joseph being in Egypt. So if we look there at chapter 39, verse number 1, we'll see it picks up directly where it left off. Almost the exact same statement. It says in verse number 1 of chapter number 39, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now I briefly mentioned uh, uh, this uh, in Genesis chapter number 37. And that is, this is a supposed discrepancy or a supposed contradiction in the Bible. If you look here in Genesis 39, verse 1, notice it says at the very end there, uh, speaking of Potiphar, it says he bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites. So it says he bought Joseph of the hands of the Ishmaelites. If you go back to Genesis 37, the very last verse again, verse 36, you may or may not have noticed this, what we just read. It says, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt. So uh, uh, atheists and, and God-haters and people that don't believe the Bible, you know, Bart Ehrman and these types, will try to look at the Bible and say, hey, look at this contradiction. Look at, look at how the Bible just contradicts itself here. And they point to, you know, Genesis 37, verse, uh, Genesis chapter 37, verse 36, and they will look at Genesis 39, verse 1, and say, hey, look, here it says there is no lights, here it says the Midianites. Well, not only does it say it there in, in 37, 36, and 39, 1, but within the same chapter of verse of chapter 37, it actually goes back and forth calling them Midianites and Ishmaelites. I don't know if you remember this or not, but look up in chapter number 37 and verse number 28. It says, Then there passed by Midianites, merchant, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit. Now watch this, even within the same verse. And sold Joseph, watch this, to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So even within the very same verse, it calls them Midianites, Ishmaelites. Now, I don't know exactly how this works, but they're referred to by both. You know, it just would be speculation. It could be that the group is by and large uh, uh, Midianites, and within the Midianites there is a group of Ishmaelites. Right? Maybe, maybe it could be this. Maybe, uh, maybe their 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 land of nativity is you know Midian, but maybe they're of Ishmael. That's a very good possibility. This is not the only time this happens in the Bible. Uh, what is what about Paul? When they're beating Paul, what does Paul say? Here's a perfect example. He said, "Are you gonna are you gonna scourge a man a, a Roman unlawfully?" And they're like, "Are thou a Roman?" And then they go and tells his boss, and his boss comes back. He's like, are you a Roman? And he comes back and asks him, he says, what's he say? Yay. He is. What does Paul say that he is in Philippians 3? In Hebrew of Hebrews. So what's Paul? He can say he's a Roman. He can say he's Because sometimes we're referring, Roman there is referring to his citizenship. Right? So it can be citizenship. It can be where you're dwelling right now. It can be where you're from. It could be maybe you're uh, tracing your line as far as your uh, uh, genealogy. Where do you come from? Is, who's your father? So that's what's going on. So it's not only just these two verses. It's actually within the same verse it does it. Just proving how preposterous it is to say this is a contradiction. It's not a contradiction at all. It's just giving you this information about the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. 
uh, 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 these people specifically being identified as both. It's very clear that they're identified as both. Study it out, maybe you might find out something deeper about that. But just to show how foolish that is, that's found elsewhere in the Bible. You can see that as an example. Uh, you know, it just shows a lack of critical thinking where people are just it's, it's people just looking to say, hey, this you know, this is a, a contradiction in the Bible. I can show you where. Uh, it's very obviously not a contradiction elsewhere in the Bible, and things, the language like this and uh, the, uh, characteristics like this are used about other people. Well, they'll be called by two different types of names, uh, whatever the reason may be. So that's a, a foolish type of uh, argument that, that people will use that don't like the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 39, verse number 2 now. Let's look at verse number 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So here we can see the blessing of God is upon Joseph even after he's been sold into slavery. Uh, those are obviously good words there that says, and the Lord was with Joseph. As I've said many times, sometimes we can just read the Bible and it goes right over our head what people are actually and personally experiencing. He was just sold into slavery by his own brethren. He, he, he's, he's, he's about 17 years old at this time, and he's been taken to a foreign country. Uh, you know, probably a lot of people don't speak his language. Uh, maybe he, he, he fluently speaks the common language. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's all different types of obstacles and things that are impeding him. I'm sure it's very scary. He's still a young man, and he's been sold into slavery, and now he has to, uh, to, to, to work in servitude day in. And day out, I'm sure it's an extremely terrifying time for him. He's around strangers. He knows no one. I'm sure it's terrifying. He's in a land that he's never been in, a country he's never been in before. Uh, or at least he de you know, he's definitely not from. So it's a comforting feeling to know, hey, God is still with me. You know, to know how it tells us there, and the Lord was with Joseph. You know what Joseph didn't do is he didn't get there and he didn't just salt. And he didn't just give up. Because notice what it says. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, verse number three. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So is Joseph just not working? Is Joseph just giving up or just depressed and saying, I can't move on anymore? It's the end of my life. No, he's not. What is he doing? He's still working hard, isn't he? He hasn't just given up on life. You know, Sometimes you have obstacles and hard times come in life. And the worst thing that you can do is just give up. You're, you're going to lose then. It's, it's over. You, you've defeated yourself. You have no chance. If you just give up, there's no chance of getting out of here. You know, you're the deciding factor at that point. You're the one that needs to say, hey, I'm going to fix this. We need to be people to try to seek resolution, try to you know, uh, uh, make the best of the situations and uh, the circumstances that were put in in our life. And, see, and sometimes you, you, when you have struggles... Look at it as, you know, it can motivate you. I'll do this in my own life. It can motivate you if you look at it uh, almost as a uh, competition, if you will. And say, hey, I'm going to even try harder now, and then I'm going to get myself out of this rut, whatever it may be in your life. Uh, so you need to not give up even when you're, you're in a hard time, and a comforting thing can know, hey, God is with me. Amen. Hey, you go to prison, guess what? God is with you. God is there with you. You get sold into slavery. Whatever may happen in your life, just keep in mind and remember, the Lord is with you. And even when you're in slavery, even in, when you're in this dark valley, in this, in this ominous time in your life, keep in mind, God can still cause you, even in that situation, to prosper. He did it for Joseph. He can still bless you, and he, and, and he can still cause you to have a happy life, even in that type of situation, especially if the, if, if, uh, you know, the Lord is your joy. You know, obviously, anywhere you go, he's there with you. So you can be joyful at all times, no matter what type of situation you're in. You need to keep that in mind. Um, so it says in verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. It reminds me of the saying that everything, you know, people say this about certain people. Everything he touches turns to gold, right? So that's basically what's going on here. It says everything that Joseph does... The Lord makes it to prosper. What does he mean to prosper or to be? Uh, normally, this is referring to wealth. And in this case, I'm sure that it is. Uh, but it's just, it's basically success. It's saying that everything that Joseph touches, whatever it may be, if he sows seed out in the field, there's going to be a great fruit, that, a great amount of, of, of fruit that comes from that. There's going to be a great outcome. And anything that he touches, any work that he does, any responsibility that he's giving, given, there is a great outcome. 
There, there, there's a great prosperity that comes from that. Great success comes from that. The Lord is blessing him in every area of, of work that he's doing right now. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 20. Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 20. So he's not just blessing him for sitting on his butt. He's not just blessing him for, you know, um, like I said, he's not being depressed. You know, Joseph's working. Joseph is, is, is being a hard worker still, even in this type of situation. The worst thing you can do is give up. Joseph just kept working. And notice what it says here in Proverbs chapter number 28, verse number 20, about a faithful man. Verse number 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that make a taste to be rich shall not be innocent. So notice what it says, a faithful man. So who, who receives prosperity or who receives blessings from the Lord? A faithful man. A faithful man. Joseph, we're going to see this in this chapter. This is the major theme of this chapter is the faithfulness of Joseph. He is an extremely faithful worker. He's a, he's a very trustworthy man. So I want to put that in your mind there, the, the faithfulness of Joseph. Look over there at verse number 4. Chapter number 39, verse number 4, it says this now. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put it into his hand. So notice it says that he served him, right? Uh, he served him. I want you to turn with me to the New Testament now. Let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy uh, chapter number 6, verse number 1. First Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 1. We're going to look at a few verses in the New Testament about serving master. Now, this isn't going to apply exactly to us today as it applied to Joseph, because Joseph is, is a literal slave. He is in ser servitude, but he is an actual slave. Uh, you know, we have a contractual, contractual uh, two-party agreement in employment today in the United States of America and pretty much everywhere in the world. Of course, slavery still exists in some uh, uh, remote places, maybe some countries and things like that. But the majority of the world, especially where we live and we're familiar with, our native country, it's a contractual agreement. Hey, I mean, you're going to pay me this amount and I'm going to come to work for these hours, right? It's a, it's a two-party agreement, right, between two people. Uh, it's not, it wasn't like that for Joseph. He, it's not like, hey, uh, I'm, I'm leaving because you're not paying me of the right amount of money. No, he's being forced to work. Of course, he's providing food and things like that, but Joseph is a slave. He's a, the, the, you know, the definition of what we think of as a slave, that is what Joseph is. But even still, God commands slaves, even in that sense, to be obedient to their masters. How much even more so should you be obedient to your master in the situation you, we have in the United States of America today? As an employer, we need, to be, we need to not be so prideful to where we can't think of our boss as our master. Yeah. And where we can't use the words that you'll obey you know, uh, your boss, or you'll obey your master. You don't like the idea of him being called like Lord, not Lord like God, but just Lord like sir or boss, right? He's your boss. Yeah. And, and, and servants need to be obedient unto their masters. You need to be obedient to your boss. And you need to honor your boss. You need to respect your boss. Look here at 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 1. See this in the New Testament. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You say, hey, I don't like my boss. I don't want to be obedient to my boss. Well, let me give you a good reason why you should. That the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You want to go around saying you're a Christian and telling everyone you're a Christian. Talking about, hey, I need off Wednesday night. I can't work on Sundays. Now all of your company knows you're a Christian. You better make sure that you're that you're you know uh, having integrity around every one of your job now. Because you know what can happen? You can blaspheme. You can cause the name of God to be blasphemed and the doctrine of God God to be blasphemed. I want you to turn with me now to uh, flip over to 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. We'll see this a couple of times in the New Testament. The, the uh, uh, admonition for servants to be obedient unto their masters. Look at verse 18. It says this. Servants be subject. That's a strong word. It's like being obedient, being under. You're, you're in subjection. Servants be subject to your masters, and watch this, with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So he takes it even a step further. You're like, hey, I, I would be obedient to my boss, or I would treat him well, but he's such a jerk. 
doesn't work like that. God says be obedient to him when he's gentle, but also be obedient to him even if he's a forever boss. Even if you have a, 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 you know, a boss that is just a complete jerk, you know, every time you talk to him, he wants to rip your head off. He's just, you know, insulting you. Every time he sees you, he's just making fun of you and mocking you. Guess what? You're still, you're still supposed to be obedient to him. You're still, it, that goes to show a good testimony on behalf of Christ. I also want you to turn over with me to uh, Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. I want, to, I want to show you how many times this actually comes up even in the New Testament. Even in the New Testament, we'll see this over and over again. As I said, the admonition to servants to be obedient uh, to their masters. Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 5, the Bible says again, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Now watch what it says in verse 6. Not with eye service, as men pleasers. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So if you're having trouble being obedient unto your, your master according to the flesh, you should keep in mind, number one, hey, I don't want the doctrine of God or God himself to be blasphemed. But number two, you're serving God. You should, you should serve your master as unto Christ. All the things that you're doing is representing Christ. You are serving Christ ultimately as well. So, and we need not to be men pleasers. When we go to do a job and someone tells us, hey, you know, this is what I want you to do. This is going to be your task for the day. Hey, this is what I want you to do. You shouldn't go over there and work for a little while and wait. Whew, he's gone. And then like go sit down. You know, and I know he'll be back around you know, uh, 2.30. So I better get up and start working at 2.15 just in case he shows up a little bit early. That shouldn't be how we work. You know, we should be working like he's watching us the entire time. You should work like your boss is standing over your shoulder watching you the entire time. That's the type of work that you should do. Amen. Even more so, you should work like Christ is watching you all the time. Because Amen. he is. He sees everything that you do. And that can be a reminder to your conscience. Hey, I shouldn't sit around. I shouldn't, you know, be lazy. I should. And not only that, you know, maybe everyone here doesn't struggle with trying to, you know, sneak into a dark room somewhere. And, 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 and take a nap while you're working your, your 9 to 5, maybe you just don't give it your all. Maybe when you're working, you're, you, know, you, you do 9 out of the 10 things that you're asked on a particular project, or you just do 75% of what you're called to do. Maybe that's what you struggle with. And you need to try to do it like Christ is watching you all the time. Like Jesus Christ was standing there, and he is your taskmaster, right? He's standing there, and he's watching everything that you're doing. He's your boss, and he's your overseer, and he's standing right before you. Maybe he's the, you know, he's the overseer that's walking around in the room. You need to, you know, that's the type of attitude that we should have, you know, when we're at work and when we're serving our boss. That's the type of attitude that we should have. Because ultimately, everything that we do, we should do unto the Lord. Everything that we do, we should do unto Christ. Even when it comes to our own homes. Whatever project or anything that you're working on, we need to give it our all. Anything that we find to do, anything that your hand finds to do, you should do with all your might, the Bible says. You know, that's the attitude that we should have. We shouldn't be lazy and slothful in any areas of our life. We need to be a good worker. We need to have a good testimony amongst those. Because, you know, there are opportunities. You know, who here has gotten someone saved on the job site even at some time? Just on a job site. Every person, basically, right? So everyone's gotten someone saved on the job site, basically. So let me ask you this question. Let's say that you were just like the worst worker. Let, you know, the, just, the, just a terrible worker. You're late every day. You know, you are, uh, you're talking about Jesus all the time. You know, you're, you're talking about Jesus just constantly. But you're late every day. Every job that you do, you fail at. The boss is constantly just ripping you a new one. You know, and uh, you're being demoted. You're being sent home because you can't get the work done. How likely, those people that you got saved, how likely do you think they would have been if you would have been like, you would have walked up to them on a break like, hey man, let me invite you to my church. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Would you be interested? Let's just, just take off, you know, try to put yourself in their shoes. If you didn't know much about Christianity, you're a Catholic, or, and then there's this guy that's just like the worst worker in the world, you know? And then he comes up to you like, hey, you know, uh, let me teach you something out of the Bible. 
do you think you'd be interested in anything that guy has to say? These are, these are, there, here are three reasons why you should be careful with your testimony when you're at work, why it's important. Number one, you don't want God himself to be blasphemed. You don't want the doctrine of God to be blasphemed. Number two, you're representing Christ. You're working for, for him ultimately in the first place. And number three, don't you want to, to take advantage of the opportunities that you could have in, to get other people saved? Well, you're throwing those down the toilet if you're just going to be this lazy, good-for-nothing type of employee. Because no one's going to take you serious and no one's going to be interested in what you have to say. You know, we need to be good workers. We need to have good... Te- I'm big on this. You need to have good testimonies at work. You represent Valley Baptist Church, too. You represent me in a way. You know, be good workers. We want... How, how, how good of a testimony would it be if the church grows 100, 200, 300 people and every company that ever sees the name Valley Baptist Church, they're like, hey, I'm hiring that guy. Because we know the people that attend that church, they are the hardest workers that I've ever seen. And this is just random that popped into my mind just now. Uh, but I remember seeing a thing from Kent Hoven on YouTube where he was talking about uh, Peter Ruffman for a few minutes. And uh, he had a lot of good things to say about Peter Ruffin. <clears throat> said he met him, you know, he said he was brilliant. But one thing they said was this. He said, he said I'll tell you what, he said, uh, we did a lot of work at, uh, at Dino- Dinosaur Adventureland. And uh, he said, he said and, and oftentimes some of the guys uh, uh, from PBI, those are the guys that are going to the school. That, that is, that's the name of the school of Peter Ruckman's uh, church. He has like a, like a seminary, if you will, some kind of Bible college. He said, oftentimes the guys at PBI would come and work at Dinosaur Adventureland. And he said this, he said they were the best, all of them were the best workers I've ever had. What do you think that's a product of? It's obviously, so what do you think he thought, and what was he doing? He was actually giving a testimony about Peter Ruckman. And you know what happened was, he said, and let me tell you this too. The best workers I ever had at Dinosaur Adventureland were everybody that came from his church. What's the reason? You know, obviously it's a representation of the church. That's why he brought that up. So, you know, you may be able to bring somebody to church one day. You may be even able to get them to start attending our church from your workplace. That's possible. That's very possible. You build a relationship with someone. You get them saved. You know, and uh, you, you're then able to, hey, you know, uh, coerce them. Hey, come visit one time. But are they going to do that if you had a poor testimony at your at your job? They're not going to be interested at all. Somebody's going to invite them to church someday, and they are going to go. Most people are going to go visit other churches at some time, at some point in their life. You know, secular, non-religious, whatever they may be, they're going to people visit churches on Easter, Christmas, things like that. You know, so they're gonna be, people are looking for churches to visit. Make an impression upon people, and you might be able to bring them in. So you could change. You could by your testimony at work, you could alter someone's life. Uh, you know, all the time you hear stories about people just being invited from a coworker to a church, and now they attend that church permanently. You know, have a good testimony at your job. Be a good worker, and you, and you have no idea the the opportunities that you could be given. Right? Uh, go back to Genesis chapter number 39. Very important being a good worker. Very important being a faithful man. This entire chapter basically is about the faithfulness of Joseph as a worker. So he was made the overseer even. You know, you know uh, it's good when you know, the people at, the, at, uh, at your church excel or do well at work. It shows, hey, these guys have integrity. These guys, because if you apply the Christian Christian principles in your life, and you have Christian values in your life, you will do well. You know, the the Bible is a uh, the law of God. It is moral, of course, but it's very practical. If we follow the laws of God, we will have a blessed, prosperous life in all areas. If we follow the the advice and the counsel and the commandments that are given to us about the workplace and how to be a worker, you'll excel at your job. You'll be the best worker at your job. You will be. You'll be a boss eventually at your job. You will. That's why Joseph became an overseer. That's why he was he was promoted. You know why? Because he was a faithful man. You know, he walked according to righteousness. When it came to the way he lived his life morally, he kept the law of God. He was a righteous man, and because of that, he was promoted at his, at his job site, at his work. It gives you even more opportunities to reach out to people and, and, and to uh, have a greater influence. If you're some sort of supervisor, you, you know, people are more likely to listen to you if you go to preach the gospel to them. Uh, so the importance of having a good reputation at the workplace, being a faithful man, very important. Look at verse 5. 
And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So we can see this blessing is just spreading. So what happened was he saw, hey, Joseph, he's a hard worker and everything. You know, he's doing well. And because of that, the Lord blessed what Joseph did. The Lord blessed the things that Joseph, you know, touched his hand to and the work that he did. And so then, uh, you know, Potiphar sees this. So he's like, hey, everything that, that this man touches basically turns to gold. Everything that he works on uh, becomes very prosperous. So why wouldn't I give him more responsibility? If everything that I give him he just does exceptional with, I'm just going to give him more because he's going to keep doing great. He's going to keep doing very, you know, very well. He's a great worker. So he gives him more and more and more and, until he's basically overseeing or ruling over everything of Potiphar's house. Everything. So because of that, Potiphar is receiving all these blessings just by proxy, basically, right? Just because he's just he's just closely associated with it. Just because he's ruling over everything now. Of course, Potiphar's house is being blessed for Joseph's sake, right? In order to bless Joseph, he has to bless uh, Potiphar because that's what Joseph is ruling over. Look at verse six. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. This is interesting. And he knew not aught he had. That means anything. He knew not anything he had. Uh, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So think about this. Think about how, how faithful Joseph is. It's saying that Potiphar didn't even know what he possessed any longer, basically. He just basically just left it all up to Joseph. He basically just said, hey, I don't want to have to do anything with it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to hear about it. I don't care what I possess. I don't care what my return is on my you know, I don't want to know what my profit is. Anything. I, he trusted Joseph so much, he just said, hey, you just take care of all of it. So he never even had to go check on him. That's what it's saying. He never even had to oversee Joseph. He trusted Joseph so much. He was such a faithful man. He just handed it all over to him and he just sat back and relaxed. So he just knew basically he's got bread because he's bringing him bread every day to eat. That's the only thing he ever saw. That's what it's saying. Why? It's stressing to you how faithful Joseph was. How much he was trusted by his master. This is the relationship we should have with our boss. That's where I'm going with this. Our boss should trust us. We should be a faithful man. It's embarrassing when you can't be trusted with something. It's shameful when, when, when your boss is like, I got two guys that I got a job to give to, and they both screw it up every time. I don't know who I'm going to give it to. Or maybe you're not selected and another guy is. That's embarrassing. You should be a faithful person. You should be trusted with something. All of us should be. We should be trusted with things. You know, uh, even the women in here, if, if another woman needs someone to help them with something, you should be, you should try to be the person. I'm not trying to start a fight between, I want to be better or not, I'm just kidding. You know, but you should try to be the person that, you know, all, and all the ladies should try to be the person that when they think of, hey, I need a faithful person to help me. They shouldn't think, oh, I'm not going to invite so-and-so. She'll be late. And then she'll want to leave early. And all our kids are bright. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You should be a faithful person. You should be a trustworthy person. Where someone thinks, I know that when they come, I can give them a job to do. And I know for a fact it's going to get done. I don't even have to go out there and check it. That's what, it's, that's what he's saying about Joseph. He didn't worry about him at all. He didn't worry about Joseph or the work that he was getting done. He just knew for a fact. Just, just the bread he was bringing him. He was eating his bread, but he knew everything was good. He didn't even need to know what, it, what was going on. Look at the end of verse 6. It's important. It's kind of a, uh, a statement that's going to uh, you know, catapult us into um, the next uh, context here within the chapter. It says this at the end of verse 6. And Joseph was a goodly person and... Well favored. So those two statements together, you may you, you may overlook what this is actually saying. I'm going to prove this from the next verse as well. But notice it says that he's a goodly person and well favored. Now, if you think of a few times the word well favored is used in the Bible, uh, number one, it's used when it speaks of Rachel. It says she's beautiful and well favored. When it's talking about Leah not being pretty, right? She's tender eyed. Uh, another time it's used um, is in Proverbs 31. 
you know, uh, it doesn't say well favor, but it says, uh, um, it talks about, uh, uh, you know, beauty is, how does it go? It just slipped my mind. It talks about being vain, right? It said, it, it mentions beauty and, uh, um, and, and favor, both of them. What'd you say? What does it say? Yeah, I know, yeah, it doesn't say well favor, it says favor, right? Um, uh, beauty is deceitful and favor is vain. I may have quoted that wrong, but that's the, the, the essence of what it is. Uh, so notice how beauty, the point is this, beauty or looks or, or how you look, that is being coupled with what? Favor. What is favor? It's, it's referring to popularity, right? It's referring to uh, someone being popular. And it's also at the same time, the same people like this person, right? But it's speaking specifically about how they look. When a goodly person is used, another time that this is used is with, uh, and it says well favored, I believe, as well, is when it talks about uh, uh, Saul. It speaks of Saul, and it gives you a description of him physically. And it talks about how big he is. It talks about him being favored and him being a goodly person. This is usually referring to physical characteristics of someone, saying that they're a good-looking person. That is normally what this is talking about. And uh, if you look at the context here... The end of verse 6, it says this, And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. <clears throat> then look at verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, look at this, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. So it prefaces what it's getting, before it goes into this, it talks about how he's a goodly person and well-favored. It's saying that he is, he is a good-looking person, right? It's saying that he's, he, he's a good-looking man, right? He's handsome, you would say. Then it tells you right after that that his master's wife casts her eyes upon him after it tells you he's a goodly person, he's well-favored, saying he, he, she, he's good to look to, right? So she looks at him and sees that he's handsome. And then she says, that, it says this, and she said, lie with me. Now she's, of course, talking about uh, having a physical relationship that husband and wife would say. Now this is terrible what she's doing. Uh, and she said, lie with me. Look at verse 8. But he refused. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not, saying, No, knoweth not. That's what that means. What means no. Knoweth not, or wotteth not, what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. So he's basically repeating the same thing that he just told you a minute ago. Like, he doesn't even know what's in the house. He trusts me so much. And he's, and, he's, and he's put all of it in my hand. I have the responsibility over all of it. So he's talking about this, this the, how well he's treating him and all the responsibilities that he's given him. And not only, obviously with responsibility comes what? Wages, good wages. He's obviously paying him and treating him well because of all this work that he's doing. It says this, verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I. So he's talking about the great honor that he's received too. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. And there specifically he speaks of everything that he gives him access to. Whatever food, whatever clothing, his, his lodging, he, he doesn't keep anything back from him, right? He says, but thee. So obviously, you know, he's not going to allow him to have his wife. Right. Say, you're the only thing. He's talking about how great and everything he's given me, but there's just this one thing, hey, you can't have my wife, of course. You're not allowed to have my wife. What well, he's saying, that's the only thing that he's kept back from me. He's saying, look, look at how well he's treated me. It's not like he doesn't give me anything. He's like, you're the only thing. You know, uh, he's pointing out the fact that how ungrateful it would be that he would just want more, right? He's giving me everything, and then that's not enough. You know, it's basically like the story with David, right? And he has everything. He has all these wives and stuff. They just takes the one new land. We talked about this the other day. It's a very similar concept. It says this afterwards. He says, uh, because thou art his wife. So he's saying that's understandable because he's your wife. Of course, he's you're his wife. Of course, he's not going to give you to me. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, one thing you can learn from that is how wicked is it to commit adultery? It's great wickedness. It's not just a tiny, small sin. Adultery is a huge, huge sin. You know, uh, adultery is, you want to know what it is according to the Bible, according to Joseph, a godly man that God blessed and allowed things to prosper? <clears throat> he said it's great wickedness. And sin against God. And another thing that is being implied here, it's very interesting, is that notice how he's speaking about all these things that Potiphar has done for him. He's speaking about, hey, look how good he's treated me. He's given me everything. And the only thing he's kept back from me is you. And, and you think that I'm just going to go and, and, and lie with you? So he's talking about how, how well he's treated by Potiphar. And then he says, 
how can I commit this great wickedness? So notice that the implication is that this wickedness would not only be against God. Because he says this great wickedness, and then he says, and sin against God. That's how it's worded there. So he's speaking about, and the Bible talks about this, how you, it's not only, uh, not only oftentimes sinning against God, but you can sin against your brethren. The Bible talks about transgressing against brethren, that exact language, or sinning against brethren. So he wouldn't only be sinning against God, he would be sinning against Potiphar. He would be harming or hurting Potiphar, wouldn't he? That, you know, this is something that people need to keep in their minds, too, when we're living our day-to-day -day lives. And you have some temptation to do something wicked. You know, would to God that it's never something this wicked. But you need to think about, not only are you sinning against God, which that should be your primary fear. And that should be what should uh, you know, deter you from making a horrible decision like that, by and large. But keep in mind the other people that you're hurting, too. Because oftentimes, you're not only sinning against God, you're sinning against someone else. Oftentimes, you're not only sinning against God, you may be sinning against brethren, you may be sinning against sisters in Christ, you may be sinning against family members. So you need to keep in mind how bad you may be hurting someone else. So, not only would God be grieved with this decision, if he would have went through with this, of course he doesn't, but how badly would Potiphar have been hurt after he trusted Joseph so much, he treated Joseph so well, and then he goes behind his back, and the one thing that he said you couldn't have... That's what he did. I mean, how badly would you be hurt if that was you? Think about that. So, so you're not only, you know, grieving God. In a lot of situations, you could be hurting brethren as well. You could be sinning against your brethren too. So this is something you need to keep in your mind. You know, it's not only between your relationship. You may, and here's the thing. God is forgiving because he's perfect, Right? And you have a relationship with God, you're saved. Of course, you can get to a point if you're not saved where God will just never forgive you. You don't even have the opportunity of forgiveness. But as a, a saved believer, God will always give you forgiveness. Nothing can separate us. You can, you can sin and God will give you forgiveness. God, you know, he's still going to punish you. God will give you forgiveness. Brethren are not always that way. Now, should they be like that? Should they be unforgiving? No. But you may sin against your brethren and make a bad decision and God will forgive you. But we're human. And you could shatter a very close or good relationship with another brother, another sister in Christ that's irreparable at this point. Because they may not forgive you. That's not right. But I'm just telling you, this is human characteristics. This is human tendency. Sometimes people, you know, human beings have trouble forgiving. Because we're not perfect. We hold grudges. We become bitter. You may hurt someone where they just never forgive you. And now there's this rift in your relationship. Or maybe it just cuts you off completely and they never want anything to do with you again. These are the things you need to keep in your mind before you sin. It's not only God oftentimes that you're sinning against. Like I said, that should be our primary concern. You know, so don't misunderstand me. But you do need to understand. You need to have you know, uh, this, this self-knowledge that you're also, you could be hurting other people as well. Joseph wasn't only concerned that he was sinning against God. That was, of course, his primary concern, I'm sure. But you know what he was also worried about? I don't want to do this to Potiphar. I don't want to do this great wickedness to Potiphar after how well he's treated me in this situation that I've been put in. So we need to keep that in uh, mind as well. Think about our brethren. Think about other people that we love. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 10 now. And it came to pass that she spake to Joseph day by day. So notice she's doing this day by day. Now... You know, um, obviously, if, if, if something like this is going on, what Joseph should have done was Joseph should have went and spoke with Potiphar the very first time. Uh, you know, he should have went and told Potiphar what was going on. And, uh, and, 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 you know, he could have prevented what is about to happen. Obviously, you know, in retrospect, and I'm reading the story, it's easy for me to say that. Um, you know, but that's why the Bible is here for us, to be in sample so we can read about it and, and, and dwell upon it. What he should have done, if someone comes to you and, and tries to, you know, say something so wicked, or tries to, you know, you know, do something like that to you, you should immediately, you know, report that. Not the authorities. Obviously. You know, you, you should immediately bring that up. Obviously, in this type of case, you should, he should have went and spoke with Potiphar. That's what he should have done. You know, because uh, things like this need to be dealt with, especially something that's so serious, right? So he, he, and then it went on. Notice it said, because what's going to happen is like this, day by day. It's not just going to go away. Or it could, it could become something much worse, which it does. It says that he hearkened not unto her 
to lie by her or to be with her. Now, it's interesting we see that phrase there is synonymous, so you need to keep that in mind when reading your Bible. What did she say before, verse 7? At the end, she said, lie with me. But notice it says lie by her there. So it's, it's synonymous. It's saying the same thing. He didn't lie by her or it says be with her. Right? So this is also another phrase that can be used to speak of this type of uh, you know, sensual relationship uh, between a man and a woman. This, this would be worse wickedness, as it says. Look at verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. He's not using the restroom. Right? He's going to do his business. He's working. And there was none of the men of the house there with him. Verse 12. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So, there you can see she obviously, she's very persistent, right? And she comes and she keeps saying this. So she's obviously a very wicked woman. That's, that's very clear. She's She's a very wicked woman. This is not something she just, you know, accidentally thought about one time, which that still would be wrong, right? This is something that she is pursuing, you know, heavily. And so this is this is something that and she's probably committing other horrible things with other men. This is probably not the first time. So obviously a very wicked woman. She's very persist persistent about this. And apparently she she grabbed a hold of him very firmly. Uh, to the point when he like gets away from her and rips away from her, that she keeps his garment. So she's able to hold on to his garment because she's trying to hold on to him. And he like, so it's becoming to the point where she's like trying to basically, you know, rape him in a sense. She's trying to hold him down and force him to a degree, at least force him to agree that he will do this, right? And he feels like he has to physically get away. So we can see Joseph being a very righteous man, can't we? Where he, he is not going to fall into this trap, is he? So he gets away from her. And then verse 13. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. So notice it's because she sees this and he ran away and she has his garment here. Verse 13. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 14. That she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me. And I cried with a loud voice. So further we can see just what a wicked woman this is. When he's being a righteous man, he's doing everything that he can to stay away from her. And he's day after day saying, no, I'm not. You can see that his heart's right. He explains why he would never do this. And you can see his loyalty and his words to his boss. And then he flees away from her. And now she just lies about him and says, he was trying to force me. So a couple things we can learn from this. Number one, if you look at verse number 12, it says, uh, verse 13, I'm sorry. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth. So it seems as if she may be, number one, bitter. Because he, you know, she, he's just, she just like basically, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't think of how I'm trying to word this. There's a specific word I'm trying to think about. But she's like putting it all in on this time. You know, this is basically her, her uh, she's going after it as hard as she can right now. You know, she's trying to make sure I'm going to get my way this time, right? She, she gave 100% this time to try to get him you know, to lie with her. And he's like not happy, right? He flees away. So she's probably bitter, number one. But number two, she could be concerned that maybe he's going to try to go tell Potiphar now. She could be worried at this point that maybe he's going to go and say, hey, this is getting out of hand. She's got my garment now. She's trying to force me. She's, you know, holding me down and trying to force me to lie with her. So she yells out, and the men come, and then she says this. She makes a statement. She has brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. So notice how she tries to also make it kind of racial. You know, he brought it, she brought it, he, she's like speaking down, obviously. He brought in this Hebrew to try to mock us. You know, he brought it in. Now, that also tells you that this isn't common for Hebrews to come in and to work like this. Because she, you can see she's speaking like this doesn't happen. He brought this Hebrew in. Now, if, if, if he's bringing in a bunch of Hebrews, that wouldn't make sense. It's because he, as a Hebrew, excel. obviously they probably uh, have Egyptians, the servants that are working in the house and have the type of role and the authority that Joseph has, probably normally an Egyptian. But in this case, it was a Hebrew. So she tries to use that against uh, Joseph, and, and uh, then she says this afterwards, he came in 
he came in unto me to lie with me. And she says, and I cried with a loud voice. So now she's trying to make herself out to be like she's the victim. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, you know, and she probably holds out the guard, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So she totally twists the story, acting like, you know, uh, he's trying to hold her down and force her. And when she, you know, lifts up her voice and cries aloud for help, for somebody to come help her, you know, that he left his garment there. He forgot his garment. And, she, and then he ran away. So she's making it look like Joseph is trying to seduce her. Joseph is trying to, you know, make advancements upon her. And she's the victim and she wanted nothing to do with it. He's almost trying to rape her is how she makes it sound. Verse 17. And she spake unto him according to these words. I'm sorry, verse uh, 16. And she laid up his garment by her. So she left the garment sitting there with her until his Lord came home. That's talking about Potiphar. Verse 17. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. So now she brings up the fact that he's a Hebrew servant. And so that makes you think that, you know, that she's trying to use it in a pejorative or a derogatory way. To, you know, mock him or make fun of him even. And it says that he came in unto me to mock me. And, and it came to pass, verse 18, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. Verse 19, And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Let me ask you this question. How does it look to Potiphar? When he comes home and his wife is telling them this story about how Joseph comes in and tries to force her, and she yells out, and then the Hebrew servants come in, or I'm sorry, the other servants come in. I'm sure they're Egyptian. They come in, and she tells this story to them. Hey, I have the garment. He just tried to force me, and then he ran away. Potiphar's thinking, where's Joseph, and why isn't he here? You know, this is how your mind works when you hear a story like this. When you hear it, whether it be like this, a lie, uh, and someone comes to you and they're telling you the story, he's thinking, that's how your mind runs with things. Uh, oftentimes, people have the tendency to believe the first thing that they hear. And this, it's important to uh, diligently inquire about that. This is why you don't take just the word of one person. You need to have uh, you know, uh, two to three witnesses, right? At the mouth of two or three witnesses, uh, every word should be established. You shouldn't just take one person's word. So I'm sure Potiphar believed the story. It says his wrath was kindled. I'm sure he believed it as soon as she said it. Then what do you think she says? Yeah, bring in the other servants and ask them what happened. Then the servants come in and they're like, you know, the Potiphar's inquiring, hey, what happened with you? Well, they weren't there to actually see it. That's why you have to diligently inquire. Hey, what happened with you? What did you see exactly? Tell me your, you know, uh, your perspective or your, your view on it. Well, we heard her scream, and we ran in here, and she's holding Joseph's shirt. Joseph's nowhere to be found. She's crying, and she's saying that he just tried to force her, tried to, you know, uh, uh, have his way with her. You know, and uh, she's been crying at home ever since. How does it look to Potiphar? That's why you just don't believe you know, everything you hear the first time somebody comes to you, we have the tendency, like I said, the first person, the first story that you hear, for whatever reason, that sticks in your mind more so, and you just want to believe that person. You want to believe, and they, and they don't even say, hey, I have the evidence. And they would ask questions like, why, did, why is his garment here then? You know, why did you leave your garment behind then, Joseph? You know, how do you think this looks, Joseph? This is, you know, this happens in life. Sometimes things are not as they seem. You know, you, it's why you don't judge according to appearance. You judge righteous judgment. You have to seek out the truth on things. And uh, when you read the Bible, you know, uh, and, you, and, you, and you actually look at and, and look at the stories and how things unfold, there is, and this is just the truth, there is conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy. How did Joseph end up in, in Egypt in the first place? They, his brothers, what? Conspired and then lied to his father and they believed it. This is, this is just the real world. You know why? Because men are deceitful. Human beings are very, very deceitful. And they'll lie, and that's exactly what goes on one after another. You see this all throughout the Bible. People lying about things, saying that things happened when they didn't happen. Uh, um, people misrepresenting things. Uh, you're just twisting truths. Look what it says in verse 20. This is the result of this, of this lie, how it hurt Joseph. And Joseph's master took him 
and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoner, prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So I'm sure Joseph tried to explain things to Potiphar to some degree. Hey, this, this is what happened. You know, this is how it happened. But he's not listening to him, right? Look at verse 21 now. Watch what it says next. But, even though he's in the prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So notice, Joseph sold into slavery. This is a major negative, obviously. He's taken to a foreign country. He's there amongst the Egyptians. Uh, I'm sure he's, he's treated poorly. I mean, he's a slave, right? At least from the beginning, he was treated poorly. Initially arriving, he's uh, you know he, he he's away from his family. He's hurt by his family uh, in the first place. They they betrayed him. I'm sure he's got just just all this emotions and depression. I'm sure he's he just just torn apart emotionally. Then things seem to get a little bit better, don't they? At least a little bit, where he's excelling, he's prospering. Uh, he's got all this authority. Things are going great. He's he's being given all of you know these uh, these, these uh, uh, benefits, right? All these great wages. He's he's not he can have anything that he wants basically. Uh, from a captain, I'm sure this man is very wealthy. Mm. At the time when, when uh, Egypt was like an empire, they had tons of wealth. So he's he's prospering in a great way. And then what happens? Something like this happens. Now he just lost everything, and he's thrown into a dirty, dark dungeon, a prison, when he thought things were getting better. But what does it say? Look at verse 21. That's important. The very beginning. But the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. So even when things are good, they're bad, they're good, and then they're bad again. But the Lord was with Joseph. Notice it repeats that again. So when did it say that before? Right when it told you, right at the beginning of, of, of Genesis 39, verse number 2, right after it told you that he was brought that he was brought down, he was put into slavery, it said, but the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. When? When he's going through a hard time. Amen. Things got good for a little while, right? Started to prosper, started, you know, great benefits in life. And then, bam, like something horrible happens again. Terrible. Can you imagine that? Being thrown into prison now? But then it says this, but the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. That's powerful, man. Amen. That's powerful. That's something to keep in mind because life is like this. Life is like this. Terrible things happen in life. Terrible things. Horrible things happen in life. One after the next, after the next. And you know what happens is, you know, you might, you might get up to the top of that hill and stay there for a little while. But ultimately, let me promise you, ultimately you're going to come down. You'll go back up again in life, but that's how life is. It's filled with ups and downs constantly. Life is not perfect. There is so much heartache and so much trouble and so much problems in life. Problem after problem, issue after issue, just all through life. Marriage, everything. There's always going to be problems in life. Always. In all areas of our life. You know what you need to keep in mind? The Lord is with you. If he's our focus, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Amen. If our mind is on God and on Christ and on you know, uh, righteousness and peace, virtue, and all, all, you know, all things that bring happiness, walking in the Spirit, it doesn't matter whether we're up or down. Because he's with us. That's always the same. You know, we, we, need to, we need to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Amen. If we're focusing on everything here, of course, you know, when you're up, you're going to be up. When you're down, guess how you're going to be? Down. When you're in prison and you're focusing on prison, how do you think you're going to feel? But if you're focusing on the Lord and you're, you know, reminding yourself, the Lord is with me. Thinking in your mind and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, just envisioning about how things are going to be. I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for, for him, them that love him. You just, you know, thinking about all the great joy that we're going to have for just, you know, all of eternity, millions and millions of years, just going on and on and on, singing hymns and, and all of that. Just the joy of the Lord. If, if you're focusing on the joy of the Lord, it doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're up or down. Just remember the Lord is with you. And you'll keep, you know, nothing can take that happiness away from you. It's like when Paul and Silas are in the prison. What are they doing? They're singing hymns. They're belting hymns out. Why? You know what they knew? 
They knew, I'm sure they had read Genesis 39. Maybe even they thought, the Lord was with Joseph, he's with me. Amen. Isn't that comforting? Yeah. You can think about how God dealt with other children of his. You know, of course he's going to deal the same thing, the same way with us. The Lord is always with us. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. So when you're in prison, guess where he's at? The Lord is with you. You know, whatever trials you find yourself or in or tribulations or any problems you have in life, think about just these verses. You know, the Lord is with me. The Lord is still here. You know, think about, you know, think about how powerful our God is. Just how he, he's, he's the Lord of the universe. He spoke this world into existence. You think the problems of this life between human beings are too much for him? He created every molecule in this universe. The same God who, who, who calmed the sea. You think your problems in your life are too big for you? You think the storms that you have in your life are too big for you when he can stand there and just calm the sea with his words? And you're just like, yeah, he, he can't calm this storm I'm going through. You know, it's ridiculous when you stop and think about it, isn't it? It, it, it? it really, truly is. And then it makes you understand, hey, being in prison ain't that bad. You know what I mean? It's really not. The Lord is with me. What do I have to worry about? I'm going to heaven one day. All my children are going to heaven one day. My family's going to heaven. I got great brethren. They're praying for me. Amen. You know? God forbid I don't really have to go to prison here soon, right? But I'm going to be thinking about this verse if I do. And you should do, right? Amen. You never know what's going to happen in this country. You never, you, you have no idea, you know? In 60 days, I'll be doing a full sermon about the state of our country. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, I mean, we need to keep in mind that the Lord is with us. And he's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Neither height, nor death, right? Nor principalities, nor power. Talking about nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come. I think I pointed this out in one of the sermons, how he's literally saying, he, he references all aspects of space. I death, right? And then he references all aspects of time. Thanks, present, thanks to come. What's the point of that? That's, that encompasses everything in the world, in the universe. That's the point. Nothing that exists. That's what he's saying. No space, time, nothing. Anywhere. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. It didn't matter where Joseph was. It didn't matter what was happening. It didn't matter that he was in Egypt and his family was miles and miles away, hundreds of miles away, however far away it was, exactly. It didn't matter whether he was in prison or whether he was in Potiphar's house. It didn't matter. The Lord was with him. Amen. The Lord was with him. And he was never going to leave him nor forsake him. He was looking out for him the entire time. Look at the next verse. Verse number 22. And the keeper of the prison, look at this, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. So notice how even in this situation, what is he doing? It may, you may focus on the negative. Hey, he's in prison. But God's still blessing him, even while he's in this situation. God's still with him. God's still working things out. And you know what? Like the Bible tells us that all things work together for good and then love God. And then we're on the call according to his purpose. There's, there's, a, there's a, an ultimate uh, a goal here that God is trying to work out. And you may not be able to see it where you're at in your life right now. You may just be focusing on the fact that you're in prison. But God's still with you, giving, giving you blessings right now. And ultimately, down the road, you'll be able to see the big picture. How all things were working together for good. You know, we, there, there's all different types of reasons that we go through trials and tribulations. You know, number one, God talks about how he wants to purify us. He's refining us like gold, right? These trials and these tribulations, they can make you a stronger person. You, they can either make you a weak person because you just give up. And then it's just over with. Or if you fight through it, now you have the experience of this. And you're that much stronger in your faith. You're that much stronger as a person now in your life. So there's, there are benefits to these trials and these tribulations. Not only that, you can be a testimony to other people. Like when Paul went to prison, talks about how other people were emboldened to preach the gospel because of his bonds. So if you go through it and you go through the trials, the tribulations with patience, you can encourage others to do greater things for God. 
And Joseph, that's the case with Joseph here as well. He ends up, you know, after the trials and tribulations, of course, I'm sure, he, and we can see that he's a much stronger Christian. He, uh, he benefits and helps his brethren and all of the nation of Israel, which ultimately brought the Messiah to come one day, kept all of them alive, right? You know, by preserving Judah and preserving, you know, uh, his offspring, Pharaoh, of course, ultimately, Right? We can see how he was helping other people, but not only that, he was pinned down in Scripture. Look at all the benefits that came from this. And now I got to stand up and, and preach just like the Lord with Joseph. He went with you. He's encouraging you. You see, this is a perfect example of how other people's trials and tribulations can encourage you. So guess what? Your trials and your tribulations can encourage others too. Exactly the same way. Look at verse uh, 23. And also there at the end, notice that and whatsoever they did there end of verse 22. And what sort of they did there? He was the doer of it. Notice he's still faithful. He's still the man like, hey, I got a job that needs to be done. Joseph's like, I'll do it. He does work for him. And what does he realize? You know, this guy's a hard worker. Everything this guy does, is, it, it, you know, it, it just prospers every time. Why? Because you can see the Lord is with him. Because he's a faithful man. He's a faithful servant. Right? Who can find a faithful servant, the Bible talks about, right? The Bible talks about how, how every man, you know, will glory of himself, but a faithful man, who can find? People will boast about themselves, they'll talk about how great of a worker they are, but who can find one? It's, it's like the, it's, it's the, the rhetorical uh, statement about the virtuous woman. You, it's hard to find a virtuous woman, right? Well, it's hard to find a faithful servant, you know? We need, as Christians, to be faithful servants. We need to be faithful men. We need to have a, this is a perfect example of having a good report of them with, or without. Notice everybody he works for, what do they do? They love it. This is the type of attitude that we should, you know, this is the type of testimony that we should have as Christians. A good report of them which are without. This is how we should be. We should be blameless like this. We should, you know, have a good testimony. Now, of course, people can say, hey, well, look at what happened with Joseph with Potiphar. Well, it wasn't true. You'll, you, you'll be falsely accused of things sometimes. That's what people are trying to say about me. But you got blameless. Because of what happened you know, with Stephen Anderson. Well, that's a lie. It's like what happened with Joseph. Amen. Amen. You know, every other company that I've worked for, every other company, I've been in management, supervisor, been treated super well, you know, but I was just the worst employee, I guess, that they for. You know? We need to have a good report. You, you, you'll be falsely accused sometimes of things. Just like Joseph. It happens. It's the real world. For you know, Different reasons compel different people to falsely accuse people, to set people up, or whatever it may be. You know, different people have different motives, right? All scenarios are different. We need to have a good report of them. Which are them. Avoid the, the false accusations. Avoid the foolishness. Just keep on being a faithful servant. Just keep on being a faithful servant. You know, whether you're in the prison, whether you're in Potiphar's house, whether you're being treated well, whether he's gentle, whether he's froward, wherever you find yourself, keep serving God. Just be happy with what you have. Be happy with where you are. Just serve God and be a faithful servant. Look at verse 23. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now I want you to notice the exact same statements are being reiterated about when he was in Potiphar's house. Isn't that interesting? Everything. Number one, it says, just like with Potiphar, now the keeper of the prison doesn't even have to look at what Joseph's doing. Think about how two men said that. Within, I don't know how, what the exact time period is. That shows what an exceptional, not just a good worker, he is an exceptional worker. He's exceptional. He is... He is like the epitome. Remember I mentioned this is the theme of the chapter. He is the epitome of a faithful servant. What does it mean to be a faithful servant? It means someone you can trust. Two men that Joseph worked for, both of them said, Joseph, I don't ever even have to check what he does. It's perfect every time. I don't even have to look at it. I know for a fact it's going to get done, and it's going to get done right, and it's going to prosper. Both times. You see that. In this same chapter. Then not only that, you know, remember it mentions again, because the Lord was with him. Afterwards it says, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now, is, is Joseph just being a lazy worker and God's just blessing stuff after he walks away? 
you know, like he's like, hey, go plant this seed. And he just like sets the bag down and he like goes and takes a nap and the Lord's like taking the seed, spread it everywhere. No, it's because he's a great worker. God is on top of that. Remember what that verse that we read uh, 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 in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 28 said? Or maybe 28, 20. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20, it said, a faithful man's blessing will abound. Something along the lines of that. You know, a man that's faithful, yeah, his, he, he will abound in blessings. That man will. You know why Joseph was blessed here and everything was prospering? Because he's a faithful man. Why are they not have, is he not having to look at anything that he does? Because he's a faithful man. Because he's trustworthy. That is the definition of a faithful man or a trustworthy man. You know, be a faithful man and God will have things prosper for you too. You know, I believe, you know, you know, if you go out there and you bust your butt, you, you gotta think about this. You guys, let's say there's 10 employees that work there with you uh, at your company. Right? You're the only man that's saved. You go out there and bust your butt. Think about the major advantage that you have as a child of God. That on top of you being a hard worker and doing the best you can possibly do, you have the Lord on your side who's there to make sure that he blesses you. If you're a faithful man, he'll make sure that you're blessing him out. So that's, that's an even further incentive to make sure that you work hard because God will give you an additional blessing. He will bless you. more. So you know what will happen? Before you know it, you'll end up being the overseer. You know, the same thing goes for all the ladies. Anything that they put their hand to, if they were to be a faithful servant with whatever they're given from God, God will bless that and will cause it to abound. You know? And in and, and all the areas of, of any kind of work of any person, God will bless it. If they're a child of God and they're a faithful servant with what God has given them, God will bless them, and God will be with them. Any, any time of our life, it doesn't matter where we are, you know, height, none of that matters, right? God's always with us and will never forsake us. Amen. Something to keep in mind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for being with us. Dear Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Dear God, I promise you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We're sealed into the day of redemption. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, for uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the comfort. And uh, the, uh, uh, all of the words, uh, dear Lord, that uh, that bring uh, that can bring comfort, dear God, in our lives, maybe in hard times, or or uh, the verses of encouragement, and and uh, also all of the uh, admonitions in our lives, just to be uh, faithful workers, and all of the, the the benefits and the blessings that can come with it. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for just your mercy and your grace, uh, and giving us the things that we we don't deserve, dear Lord, and just being with us. We thank you for all the opportunities you've given us in life, dear Lord. And, uh, living in this country and, and uh, everything that you've allowed us to have. Help us not to take anything in our life uh, for granted, dear Lord. Be with us and bless our families and all the children that are here and bless, continue to bless the church. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.